Ever stumbled upon a classic movie that just sweeps you off your feet? There's something magical about stumbling upon a gem from the past, like uncovering buried treasure in your own backyard. Directed by a legendary filmmaker, this cinematic journey takes us back to a time of chaos and laughter. As you dive into the story, you're whisked away to the early days of a world at war, where the streets of Los Angeles buzz with anticipation and paranoia. Alongside a cast of quirky characters, you experience a roller coaster of emotions from belly laughs to heart-wrenching moments. As the tale unfolds, you're treated to a myriad of surprises and behind-the-scenes tidbits that add depth to the movie-watching experience. From unexpected cameos to hilarious mishaps, each revelation adds another layer to the film's charm. Whether it's the uproarious dance sequence or the nail-biting air raid scene, there's no shortage of memorable moments to cherish. Now, as you reflect on your own journey with this cinematic masterpiece, you can't help but recall the fond memories it's brought into your life. Whether it's sharing laughs with friends or finding solace in the story's message, the impact of this film is undeniable. So, as you continue to unravel the mysteries of this timeless classic, don't forget to share your own tales and experiences. After all, the magic of storytelling is best enjoyed when shared with others. Ever wondered what happens when a renowned director decides to dip his toes into the comedy pool? It's like watching a juggler try to balance one too many balls. The movie, directed by someone known for their skill across various types of movies, offers a mix of chuckles and yawns. You might find yourself laughing one moment and checking your watch the next. He gathered quite the cast, from familiar faces like Robert Stack and Treat Williams to unexpected ones like Christopher Lee and Toshiro Mifune. They all bring their own flair to the table, but the ensemble feels more like a crowded party where everyone's talking at once. The story takes place during a time when America was on edge about a potential Japanese invasion in 1941. The movie tries to poke fun at the absurdity of the situation, but sometimes the jokes miss the mark. Despite its flaws, there are some standout moments. John Belushi's wild pilot character is a riot reminiscent of his antics in another famous movie. In the opening scene, a nod to the director's earlier work sets the stage for what could have been a great ride. Overall, it's a mixed bag. For fans of the director, it's an interesting detour in his career. But if you're looking for a smooth ride from start to finish, you might want to steer clear. In conclusion, it's a movie that sparks different reactions from different folks. Some might find it a fun diversion, while others might be left scratching their heads. Either way, it's worth a watch for those curious about the director's foray into comedy. In a stirring teaser trailer directed by John Milius, Dan Aykroyd's voice urges viewers to enlist, warning of a future where street signs will be written in Japanese if they don't. To create distant explosions, assistant director Flowers used an estimated 50,000 to 75,000 flashbulbs during production. David L. Landers and Michael McKean's characters, Willie and Joe, pay homage to Bill Malden stars and Stripes cartoons, portraying the average American Gias. These characters represent the soldiers' daily lives outside of combat, adding depth to the narrative. The movie 1941 is a 1979 comedy that takes creative liberties with historical events, including the actions of the I-17 submarine off the west coast of the United States after Pearl Harbor. In reality, the I-17 did attack the west coast, shelling the tanker immediately off Cape Mendocino, California on December 20. The ship was abandoned and later scrapped. On December 23, the I-17 attacked the tanker SS Larry Doheny, causing significant damage but not sinking it. The submarine also fired at oil tanks off Santa Barbara, causing minimal damage. Despite claims of sinking a cargo ship, no evidence was found. The I-17's campaign ended on March 12 without significant success. Harold Ramis initially wrote the screenplay, but was fired due to creative differences. One deleted scene featured a nod to the real-life friendship between characters Captain Wild Bill Kelso and Sergeant Frank Tree, played by John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd, respectively. In the movie, the original script was a black comedy titled The Night the Japs Attacked. Toshiro Mifune personally trained the Asian extras hired to play the Japanese submarine crew. He was reportedly annoyed that they lacked real training, so he used his own military background to teach them how to act like sailors. Steven Spielberg originally wanted Roy Scheider for the role of Major General Joseph W. Stilwell. These decisions and contributions shaped the movie's development and characters significantly, ensuring authenticity and depth in the portrayal of the story. In an unusual move from his usual routine, a well-known Japanese actor appeared in an American movie back in 1979. It was the only time he used his own voice for English lines, even though he wasn't fluent in the language. 
Instead of speaking English fluently, he imitated English sounds the best he could. But in his other movies where good English was needed, another person's voice was used while he moved his lips along. Looking back on his career, the actor wished he had learned English better. In another interesting fact, the famous sign in Hollywood originally said Hollywoodland until 1947 when it got changed. In the film, one character is shown shooting the land part of the sign-off. Another notable thing in the movie is an actor who speaks entirely in German, even when he's arguing with other characters. This adds a real feeling to his role as a German character. In the movie, a tank named Lulubel, modeled after a tractor, pays homage to its predecessor in Sahara, which featured an authentic M3 tank named Lulubel. Seven directors contributed to the making of this film. Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale wrote it, with John Milius as executive producer and Steven Spielberg directing. Brian De Palma added a notable gag involving Slim Pickens and a reference to Hollywood. Samuel Fuller and John Landis make cameo appearances. Before its release, Steven Spielberg discussed the film with critic Pauline Kael, who warned him of potential critical backlash given the success of his previous films. Ironically, Kael ended up giving 1941 a positive review upon release. Initially set up at MGM, the movie found its home at Columbia Pictures because Spielberg preferred working there. Spielberg convinced Universal to co-produce due to contractual obligations. Joe Flaherty appeared in three films written by Zemeckis and Gale 1941, Used Cars and Back to the Future Part II. Spielberg's decision to make a comedy surprised Hollywood insiders who doubted his ability to deliver humor. Often regarded as Spielberg's first failure, 1941 proved to be a moderate box office success, earning $92 million worldwide on a budget of $35 million. However, it fell short of the expectations set by Spielberg's earlier hits, Jaws, and Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The incidental music at the end of the movie bears a striking resemblance to the music in Stripes. Additionally, the dance music during the UFO dance hall fight scene strongly resembles Benny Goodman's Sing, 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 albeit with some alterations. Susan Backlany, who played the first victim in Jaws, reprised her role as the Polar Bear Club woman at the beginning of the movie. There's a fan theory suggesting a connection between the two films, proposing that Chrissy from Jaws is the daughter of the Polar Bear Club woman. During the production of the movie, Spielberg filmed a scene with John Belushi on a submarine after receiving feedback from the audience during the previews. At one point, Spielberg joked about turning the movie into a musical halfway through production, thinking it might have improved it. Christopher Lee, who played the German officer, delivered his lines exclusively in German. Lee was not only fluent in German, but also in French, Italian, and Spanish. Additionally, he had moderate proficiency in Swedish, Russian, and Greek. Overall, these anecdotes shed light on some interesting behind-the-scenes aspects of the film.